Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 38th and final meeting of 2018. Before we move on to the first item in the agenda, I remind everyone to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. So the first item on the agenda is for the committee to take further evidence on the REACH Amendment of EU Exit Regulations 2019. And this morning, I'm delighted to welcome Mary Goujon, Minister for Rural Affairs and Natural Environment, Don McGilvery, Deputy Director of Environmental Quality and the Circular Economy, and Lorraine Wal Walkinshaw, Solicitor for the Scottish Government. Good morning to you all. Okay, so we took some evidence last week on uh, the REACH um, notification. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with a, a broad question for, for you, Minister. Um, can you set, set out why the Scottish Government is satisfied with uh, to consent to these regulations? Well, generally there is a, there's quite a complex mix of devolved and reserved uh, powers within this uh, within this SI, and that's why that why we would agree to the to the SI as it comes forward at the moment, and we would give our consent to that. Obviously, this isn't an ideal situ situation for us, and this is we believe this is the best way forward to deal with a no deal scenario if we find ourselves in that position. Because I think if we were to deal with this or attempt to deal with this uh, in a Scotland only capacity, I think that uh, it, that wouldn't benefit industry. And I think that this is such a complex area. I don't think that we would have the capacity to do that either. So I think that this is again, not an ideal situation. We don't want to be in this position. Ideally, hopefully, I hope that we end up with a deal and we're able to, to work through this. But in terms in terms of this SI, we believe that this is the, the best way forward and the most realistic and pragmatic approach that we can take uh, to dealing with, with the REACH. So it's really about continuity and giving businesses and, and the sector some kind of clarity should a no deal situation. Absolutely, because what's being proposed is essentially a mirror image of what's of, of the current EU REACH regulations at the moment and how that would operate in the UK. Because uh, that's our concern is what this will mean for industry, because this is a regulation that will have a big impact. So we want to make sure that that process is as easy and straightforward as possible. It will be complex. The timescales are obviously very challenging in order for that to be achieved. But we believe that this is the best approach for that to be done, for us to work together on a UK basis uh, to enable that to happen. Obviously, um, things might change in, in the future. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, um, at the moment, obviously, it's a, sh a shared framework with, with the UK, but is there scope within it for, should the Scottish Government diverge in their approach to certain uh, regulations that they have the power? Should there be a, maybe a a difference in view as to how we should proceed in the future? We do currently have the power and that power wouldn't change uh, within the UK system anyway. If there was, say, a substance of concern to us in Scotland and we wanted to take action on that, we would still be able to do that within the new system. Um, I know that, uh, having a look at the evidence that the committee took last week, I know that there was a concern there about policy divergence. And if there was a divergence from a, from a number, from the different stakeholders uh, that you spoke to. The way that it works at present, I can't, see that being too much of an issue. As far as I'm aware, under the current EU REACH system, um, other member states, I don't think there has been an issue with other member states taking a, a different approach. Certainly within the UK, we can't envisage that being an issue at the moment, but it is something that we would have to, to monitor closely as we went along. As I say, the power for us to take action, if there was a substance of concern, we would still have that, and we would be able to initiate a process where we can take action on that as well. Um, but it's not within our best interest for there to be, uh, for there to be any policy divergence. And if anything, I think that that I, I made the same commitment to the committee last week. We want to uphold the highest environmental standards possible and we, would, we want to keep pace with what's happening in the EU as well. And I think that this is one sector in particular where industry would like us to see, to see us keep pace with what's going on in the EU and where I think there will be close engagement uh, as a result of that too. Okay, thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Um, the Chemical Sciences Scotland last week in particular uh, pointed to uh, risk to export and import uh, industries if we do <coughs> diverge. And I note that uh, Switzerland and Turkey, although not members of REACH, do legislate uh, to keep uh, pace with uh, REACH. Uh, does the Minister think that's an appropriate approach for the UK to take, 
clearly, given that Switzerland and Turkey have done it, we know it's a possible approach uh, for a state to take. Absolutely. I, I would agree with that. I mean, obviously, again, we don't want to be in this position. And I think that if we've hopefully we're not in a no deal scenario, uh, and that's what this SI is here to deal with. But if we find ourselves where we where we're able to get some kind of deal, uh, we would be advocating that we would, first of all, remain members of Re REACH if that is uh, uh, at all possible. Um, but if not, that we would definitely try and keep pace. As I say, I think that's within the, uh, I think industry would want to see us do that. And certainly from a Scottish government perspective, we want to maintain the high environmental standards that we have and we want to keep pace with what's happening in the EU. So we would definitely be encouraging and working towards seeing that happen. Uh, obviously, that's the passive side of uh, the REACH provisions. Um, are you concerned about the potential loss of influence in actively influencing uh, how REACH develops that uh, might follow from departure? Absolutely, because that is one of the, the key risks that we face if we're in a no-deal situation and that's I think that is going to be unavoidable and again that's why we do not want to find ourselves in a no-deal situation uh, and why we don't want to be in this position. Uh, I think that the position we've taken with this SI is really making the best of a bad situation but because that is one of the things we will lose. We will lose the influence that we currently have uh, in terms of the, the REACH system. Thank you. John Scott. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, can I ask you questions about building a UK REACH database and the implications of the transitional period? Uh, and so what are the implications of not having access <clears throat> to the EU REACH database following EU exit, given it will be up to two years before the new UK database will be populated with full data about chemicals used in Scotland? I think that will be a big issue for industry, and I think that this is undeniably this is something that will have a significant impact on businesses and on industry right across the UK and I think particularly for um, small and medium sized enterprises I'm sure you heard that in your evidence last week as well and that's why we're trying to work together with the UK government to make sure that we have a system in place which minimises the disruption as much as possible uh, to businesses and industry but there's no getting away from the fact that there will be a significant impact and there will be additional costs for many businesses and industry for uh, for going through this process as well. We're trying to minimise that disruption as much as possible uh, by working with the UK government and working with HSE to make sure that when that system is established, that it is as streamlined as possible, uh, and to make sure that yes, yeah, it's, it's as smooth a transition as possible uh, for businesses and industries across the UK. Fair enough. Um, are there implications for rights of access to environmental information by consumers and the public? during the transitional period, will the public still have the same access to the information it currently enjoys? I believe that they would still do, but I'll hand over to my officials. Um, what you're touching on there, Mr Scott, is that essentially, uh, in a no-deal scenario, um, the access to the underlying commercial data in the ECA, data ECA database will fall away. So the UK, Scotland will no longer have access to that information. And then there is a two-year transition before you fully build up that information within a domestic UK context. What you've got is a balance here between the speed of the transition in terms of trying to get to a fully regulated, fully informed position as quickly as possible, but also making that transition um, such that business and industry can cope with it, cope with the timescale and cope with the demands that it places on them in terms of submission of data. So it is a bit of a compromise, that <coughs> six week and then that two-year period. Um, but there is definitely a transitional period there where you lose something by exiting ECA in that no deal scenario. In a practical sense, what will be the impact of that on day-to-day -day consumers, or will it be something that will impact particularly and only on businesses? If this has an impact on businesses and industries who are currently part of this system, then I think there will be a knock-on impact further down the line. Because I think we'll also see some businesses who previously haven't had to register with the system before having to register with a new UK system now. So I think that there will be a bigger knock-on impact of this. 
I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, and um, it, it's very difficult to judge the impact on consumers. Essentially, what we're talking during this transitional period is these, these are substances that are already registered on the EU system. So they already have a registration and authorisation at EU level. Um, but yes, um, you know, there will be a period where that underlying data isn't available to industry or consumers um, f for a period if, if, it, if it needs to be accessed. So it's, it's about trying to make that transition in a, in a period that's as short as is realistic for industry to cope with, is, is the situation we're trying to achieve here. Right, so if I've understood it correctly, then there won't necessarily be any risk to consumers or business, but there will, because these are already registered substances, but there may be just a lack of information as easily accessible as it once was. Yes. That is my understanding. Thank you. Mark Roscoe. Ask about the, the common framework um, that's described in the notification. Is there, are there more details about that framework and, and how, how is it progressing? How is, how is the development of that framework progressing? <coughs> I think the work in the substance <coughs> framework is coming along well, but in terms of further detail of that, that's something that I, we don't have at the moment. But it is progressing well, but obviously uh, engaging as closely as possible to make sure that we have a framework uh, established, but we don't have the final outcome of that yet. Right. I mean, what, what's, what, what's the process for that then? What, what's the time scale for getting more certainty as to how that framework will will operate, you know, what, what should we be looking at as a committee in terms of what then comes back? Yeah, so the, the process is essentially, a, uh, uh, at, at, at present, is a, is a four-nation uh, discussion amongst um, officials. So, for example, there are a series of meetings and workshops taking place. The most recent of those took place in Edinburgh a few weeks ago. Um, and essentially what we are trying to do is work through what are the main areas the framework should cover at the moment and then what are the governance and decision internal kind of decision making processes that will help to support the statutory framework that uh, is being put in place. Um, obviously, um, and then ideally we want that framework to be as advanced as possible for uh, end of March, start of April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you keep the committee informed of the workshops and what's coming out of that? Absolutely, we yeah. will do. But I think obviously the priority has been in trying to make sure that we are able to function as of the 29th of March right. and we find ourselves in a no-deal scenario. So I think that has been the, the utmost uh, in our minds. But obviously we will keep the... Okay. We, we want to be as open and transparent, transparent throughout this process as possible. So we'll definitely keep the committee yeah. informed and engaged with what's happening. Okay. And obviously, I mean, one of the things that might have been discussed at these workshops w would be around stakeholder engagement. So we know that with ECHA, there's this architecture within the committees where stakeholders can get involved. Um, they can be represented, perhaps, as non-voting members. How do you, and it is a concern that we're hearing from stakeholders about whether they will have their views represented, uh, articulated in some way in the new structure. How, how will this new system deal with that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, th those discussions are at an early stage as to how that engagement would happen or how that would work, but I would envisage that there would be a role for that there. But again, I can't give a categorical answer as to how that will look or how that will operate in practice. Yeah. Is that something that you're, you're putting on the table? It's yeah. certainly been a topic of, it's, it's one of the headings that we've uh, discussed amongst officials is, is, is that aspect of... of um, how to engage more widely within that right. that process. Do you think they should be more involved, stakeholders? Um, you know, there, there's certainly a role for stakeholders in, in having, um, there being good communication, I think, between any government structure that is, that is set up and stakeholders. That, that will be an important part of the process, is the way I would put it. Right. Absolutely, and I would just add to that. I mean, especially given the concerns that you heard from industry and from stakeholders last week, um, we want to make sure at all stages of so we're trying to make this as streamlined as possible for industry at the moment. Um, but that's definitely something I think, from my perspective, I think we've got to keep people engaged, um, and that's something I'd be keen to keen for us to develop. But okay. we'll definitely keep the the committee updated on that. Um, thank you, convener. Can I just take you back to frameworks and in terms of these 
potentially these frameworks not being established by the 29th of March and potentially there being a no-deal scenario. What are the implications of that to someone as a lay person like me? If you can explain that, the implications of the not being framework. Please. Yeah. The, well, I'd say that the statutory framework is still going to be there, but I think that we are working so that we don't end up in that situation where without any frameworks and without anything in place. And I think that is the priority. We know we've got that deadline. It's a very tight deadline. Again, we don't want to be in that position, but that is what we're working towards to make sure that we are <coughs> up and uh, that we have the basic legislation in place and we have a system that will function come the 29th of March if we find ourselves in a no-deal situation and that the framework would be established by that time too. So that's what we're working towards. Uh, it's, hard to for definite to say what any potential risk of that might be but that's what we're working towards at the moment and that's the position that we hopefully will be in by the 29th of March. Uh, without, I'm not meaning to really tease you but without, I mean I hear what your aspiration is but what's the default position? Sorry. Uh, I mean I, I think I think the situation will be that the governments will simply do what they need to do to make it work there simply will be less of a template and less of a governance structure around that but, but uh, the officials will still talk to each other and a solution will be found. Uh, uh, but that would be my take absolutely, on Absolutely, because there's a constant engagement between officials of the different governments anyway, so that I think that will definitely still continue. But again, we would want to have those frameworks in place because I think that's important um, Well, between the different governments as well, but also in terms of how we work with the parliamentary process to, yep. uh, and engage with the, uh, the committees and the s further scrutiny. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Finlay Carson. Good morning. I'd like to go back to the continued access to imported uh, chemicals and the safety of those chemicals. Um, the notification says there's going to be an interim notification system. However, the, the Cabinet Secretary um, back in the 4th of December suggested uh, that she wants to avoid barriers to trade to ensure they have an effective regulatory system. But uh, if there is no deal, there are real issues about unsafe materials entered in Scotland. Can I ask, do the proposed regulations address the Scottish Government's concern uh, about the risk of unsafe materials entering Scotland under a no deal scenario? Again, we don't want to see any sort of, uh, we don't want to end up in a situation where we see that kind of situation take place, where we essentially become a dumping ground for materials that, you, you know, previously. Uh, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have had I, again if there is a, a material of concern to scotland that's we can take action on that as it stands at present and that won't change under the under the current proposals um so i i wouldn't envisage that uh, hopefully we wouldn't be too much uh, too much of an issue particularly when we can still take action and again we would be aiming to keep pace with the rest of the eu uh, and working together on a, on a uk wide basis to do that i think because that's within the best the best interests of industry and businesses as well, and we wouldn't want to, again, see any sort of dilution of our standards here in Scotland. Okay, there was a specific suggestion that there was a risk uh, to uh, the chemicals that are used uh, to purify water. Um, is that still a, an issue? And do you have any other concrete examples of maybe industries or services that might be at risk for a, a disruption in chemical supplies? There is a contingency plan in place in case there is any disruption to that. I'll hand over to Dawn. Yeah, so Scottish Water, in my understanding, has been working with the other water companies across the UK to put in place a significant contingency plan to make sure that there are sufficient supplies of the chemicals needed for water treatment uh, to make sure there isn't any disruption to water supplies. My understanding is there's a high degree of confidence in that contingency plan as it stands. So that's the situation for the water industry, as I understand okay. it. Any other industries that might be in the same situation as Scottish Water? Not as far as we're aware in terms of particular issues like that, unless you have any further information I, to I, add to that. I mean, the supply chains for chemicals are so complex it's very, very hard to pin down where mm -hmm. the pinch points will come. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically um, industries that are users of a, a wide variety of different substances, process industries, manufacturing industries, um, you know, cl um, 
cleaning product manufacturers, those sort of things where there's a, a range of different chemicals used in significant volumes, those are the ones that are most likely to be affected, but it's very difficult within that wide scope to pin down exactly where pinch points might come. Okay, so there's no specific concerns about any particular industry having issues, there's no contingency, nothing that's coming up on the radar. In terms of Scottish water, there's the, con the contingency the there, but, uh, but in relation to other industries, that's, no, we don't have that information. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and good morning, uh, Minister and uh, officials. Uh, could I explore further with you um, the government and agency preparedness, particularly in terms of capacity and staffing uh, in relation to um, chemicals? And I just highlight that the House of Lords um, EU Energy and Environment Committee had expressed concerns, and I quote, we are not convinced that the government's preparations are progressing quickly enough, and in some respects the government appears to lack uh, a credible plan of action. That's obviously the UK government. Um, the, but also the ECHA, I understand, has over 5,000, sorry, 500 staff. <laughs> um, and there, there were... There was reassurance last week about the capacity of SEPA, but I wonder if um, you could expand, Minister, a bit on that in view of those, um, those comments that have been highlighted to me. Mm -hmm. In terms of SEPA, we don't anticipate there being too much uh, of an additional burden on what they do, and I believe you heard that in your evidence from them last yeah. week. Um, if anything, I, I think that, I, I mean, they potentially have uh, an increased role in the, the proposed new system if we find ourselves in a no deal compared to what they have at the moment. Um, so I don't think there will be too much of an additional burden, but obviously we liaise closely with SEPA and it is a situation that we would have to, to monitor if they did need additional resources or there proved to be any problems, then that is of course something that, that we would be monitoring closely uh, and looking to deal with. Um, however, I, I, I can't answer for HSE preparedness um, I would hope that that is something that the UK government is is considering in terms of the uh, the workload that they will have to deal with. I mean, because I have some of the registration statistics here. Uh, there are 91,536 registrations with the ECHA. The UK proportion of that is 12,449. 5,749 substances registered from the UK, which represents 1,773 companies. I think it will be a big additional role and a big additional responsibility that they will be taking on. Right, thank you. And, and I do understand also that the EU REACH regime contains a Board of Appeal. And I wonder if um, we as a committee could highlight to, to you to, to be sure that things aren't held up in that way, hopefully if, if a, a chemical company needs to appeal a decision or whatever, because that, I, I take it would be a UK arrangement now rather than a Scottish one. Yes, the appeals would go to the first tier tribunal, yeah. but I think, as far as I'm aware, I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, but I think that since the EU reach regulations came into place, I think there have only been, I think, 148 appeals over mm -hmm. the whole of that time. So, right. we do, again, we don't anticipate that being too much of an issue. I think that number's correct. Okay. <laughs> did my homework well. Um, <laughs> so again, we don't anticipate that being too much of an issue. Right, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And now questions from Angus MacDonald. Thanks, um, Kamina. Good morning, uh, Minister. We, we've already covered this morning the uh, implications for the Scottish chemical industry, and, and you mentioned earlier, Minister, that you're, you're trying to keep uh, it as streamlined as possible for, for industry. But um, perhaps you could expand on, on what assessment the Scottish Government's made of the, the potential impacts of transferring to the UK REACH system uh, on Scottish businesses, and uh, are there any particular considerations regarding impacts on small and medium-sized businesses? Well, the Scottish Government has been engaging with the Federation of Small Business. Um, again, it's but it is one of these things that is going to be particularly difficult because there will be a significant impact, I think, particularly on um, SMEs purely because I think a lot of them, uh, because I think of the additional administrative burden that they'll have to deal with that, additional costs, and I think that is a particular issue for small businesses because they may not necessarily have the capacity to deal with that. And I think in terms of the information they're being asked to provide through that initial registration period, and that uh, again, the additional information that they would need for that two-year period as well, that is an issue. But again, we've been uh, in engaging with the Federation of Small Business 
to engage with them and to try as far as we can to to make those businesses aware. Um, but that's also the role that that, that has been the role mainly of the, the UK government and HSE to engage with industry and, and the sectors uh, as a whole. So rather than having you know the Scottish government in, in doing different levels of engagement, that's been led by the UK government. But we've certainly been engaging with stakeholders to, um, to, to make sure that they're aware of what's coming and as engaged with the process as possible. So do you know if the HSE will be able to give practical help with the administrative burden? In terms, I, I can't answer for for the for the help that HSE will be able to provide. I mean, I know that there have been a number of stakeholder uh, in, engagement workshops, especially when it comes to the reach, the the new reach uh, IT system uh, that's being proposed, and to make sure that we're as as ready as possible, and that businesses have tested some some in industry have tested that system to ensure that it's as easy to operate as possible. Um, but in terms of their engagement and being able to ease that administrative burden. To be honest, I, I think that they probably wouldn't be able to do that, given the number of businesses and the number of companies that, that we're talking about here and the scale of that. It's, so it is really about trying to ensure that everyone is aware as much as possible of what they will be required to do uh, and to give them as much as inf information as possible to, to make this as easy a transition as possible. But again, it's a, it's a big ask and this is going to be a significant uh, a burden, particularly on small businesses. Indeed. Thanks. George Stevenson, you no, you're fine. Would anyone any outstanding questions or if there's anything that the Minister would like to add that she hasn't covered already? Otherwise I think that's most things, but I mean if there are any questions that come up as a result yeah. then please write to me and be yeah. happy to get back to you with responses. Okay. Well thank you very much for your time this morning to, to you all. Um, I am going to suspend this meeting briefly just to allow the panel to leave. Thank you. The second item on our agenda this morning is to consider a number of requests from the Scottish Government to the Committee to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to a number of UK statutory instruments. The first of these is the Trade in Animals and Related Products Amendment of EU Exit Regulations 2018. Uh, do any committee members have any comments on this? Stuart Stevenson. Um, I'm, I'm, it's, it's maybe the next one. So I'm, I'm, okay, that's fine. Probably. Anyone get any points on this? Is the committee therefore content for the Scottish Government to give its consent for UK ministers to lay these regulations in the UK Parliament? Content. Yeah, thank you. The second um, of these instruments is the Import and Trade of Animals and Animal Products Amendment, UK, uh, EU Exit Regulations 2018. Any comments, Stuart? Um, just looking at the quite lengthy list uh, there is of, uh, uh, in, in the annex to what the government provided, um, the, the EU regulations that are affected, I have one or two questions. They are not questions that caused me to suggest we should not prove this, mm -hmm. I hasten to add. Um, and, uh, the first of these is... Um, number two in the annex, which is Commission Decision 93 Oblique uh, 352, uh, which is about the conditions for of approval for border inspection posts located in ports where fish is landed. Um, clearly, I've got a constituency interest, as some others may have. Um, I, I think I'm confident that it makes no difference, uh, but I would quite like to have that explicitly stated. Uh, that for the operation uh, of vessels, UK and foreign vessels who land at uh, Scottish uh, fishing ports are, are unaffected by this. And in particular, uh, that uh, EU nationals 
who may be uh, uh, part of the crew uh, of vessels are not affected uh, in a material way by this, because clearly uh, they will have a new status. Uh, the many Filipino nationals who work in the industry already have a, a status as foreign nationals that I imagine will be unaffected by that. So that's point one. Um, point two uh, relates to uh, relates to uh, uh, section 43, uh, number 43, Commission implementing decision 2013 of week 519, um, and uh, also Commission implementing regulation uh, number 577 of week 2013, which is at paragraph 45, um, and uh, perhaps also at paragraph 21, which is Commission decision 2007 of week 25 of week EC. All of these uh, relate to uh, the movement of uh, non-commercial uh, animals, dogs, cats, ferrets, and birds, um, presumably in the custody of their, uh, their keeper um, across borders. Uh, clearly, implementing this uh, covers the import by people to the UK, and I'm reasonably satisfied with that. But the related question is whether there are effects on people taking their pet animals out of the UK and into the EU, uh, which it would, might be appropriate to draw our attention to. It may well be, of course, that that's a question not currently capable of being answered. Yeah. But I think it's probably important at least to post that it's a question. OK. Claudia uh, Bumish. Thank you, convener. It was, um, I won't reiterate what um, my colleague Stuart Stevenson has raised because I was going to highlight one of those issues about um, non-commercial um, uh, to and fro. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also I, I would just like to highlight, although it wouldn't prevent me from uh, supporting uh, the, the decision today, yeah. um, I'd just like to highlight the, any concerns about staff capacity um, in relation to customs. And I appreciate it's an EU issue, but with Ken Ryan mm -hmm. in my... So I guess in all the discussion about passports, pet passports yeah, is also yeah. an issue as well. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, and also more broadly, the, the importance of the fact that um, there are very serious diseases, animal diseases, that we certainly don't want to be yeah. importing into the UK. So that capacity to check is absolutely fundamental. Okay, right. We'll reflect all those points. John Scott? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just... I, I just I'm supportive utterly of all of these um, instruments, but with regard to the part two England only instruments, um, the bovine semen England regulations 2007 and the trade in animals and related pro products regulation 2011, they do not apply in Scotland. Therefore, do we have our own regulations in Scotland? Uh, what, uh, can I just seek clarification on that? I presume we must. And therefore, if we do, then do they not need amended as well? Or does that come as under a separate piece of work? Or are all they already amended? I'm just, just seeking clarity around that, if I've expressed myself coherently, which is probably... OK, so in our letter, we can reflect a lot of the clarity that we're seeking around a, a number of these. Is there any other points we'd like to include, Stuart Stevenson? It's, it's merely an observation in relation to what John uh, Scott has just said, um, that uh, in, 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 the draft essay covers five GB-wide instruments. In other words, it does not cover Northern Ireland. Um, and I think it's as well just to note note that. Now, I believe and understand that is because they have their own regulations and, of course, having a land border mm. with another state, there are some issues that wouldn't in the same way apply to ourselves. OK. Just to complicate it further. All right, but no one has actually um, come up with anything that would stop you from supporting us writing a letter. And, um, just, just to check with everyone. Happy. Can we confirm the committee will write to the Scottish Government in relation to the instruments considered today, taking all these points into consideration? Thank you. 
Right, that concludes those items of the committee's agenda in the public session. At its next meeting on the 8th of January, the committee will continue its consideration of EU exit notifications, and the committee will also consider a draft report on the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill at Stage 1. So, as previously agreed, the committee will now move into private session. I request that the public gallery be vacated.